Christ, Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This morning we find ourselves peering into a magnificent moment in the life of Mary Magdalene. And she was swept up into the kairos, the, the supreme moment when time met eternity and our salvation was secure. Mary Magdalene was an eyewitness to the risen Christ, who all that morning had conquered death and conquered the grave. And she was there. Mary was with Jesus through it all. She never left or betrayed him, even when situations were dire. And claiming a faith in Jesus Christ could, even as it did those young Kenyans last week, cost her life. <coughs> Mary was a rise or die. Yes. So this morning I would like to take a few moments to shine the sermonic spotlight on Mary Magdalene. And her lingering love. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need a love that loves me enough to linger. <laughs> you might as well leave now. There's nothing else to be done. It's over. These, I imagine, may have been the words of Joseph of Arimathea to Mary Magdalene as the great stone was rolled in place at the door of the tomb, which completed the hastily arranged burial of Jesus. Mary had been sitting quietly in a state of stunned grief, observing as Joseph completed the burial transactions for Jesus. He is actually dead. They have killed my Lord. I imagine Mary thought to herself. Her eyes, I can see them, were red and puffy from tears of sorrow that had silently run down her cheeks and dropped to the ground even as her Lord's sweat had done as he bore the cross and even as his blood had done when he was pierced in the side. Will the tears ever stop flowing? I imagine she asked herself. A couple of times I believe she thought that Others 
follow him when they wanted something from him. Yes. But Mary Magdalene was part of that small group of women who, along with the disciples, had followed him from place to place to place. In time, she had become one of his strongest and most visible supporters. <coughs> Mary Magdalene, I understand, is mentioned 14 times in the Gospels. Eight of those times when she is mentioned, she is mentioned with other women. Her name, though, leads the list. Yes. She is mentioned alone five times in passages relating to the death and resurrection of Jesus. In one instance, her name comes after those of the mother and the aunt of Jesus. Along with them and others, she stood by the cross of Jesus. But because of their relation to the Master, his kinfolk were mentioned first. It would not have been proper to list Mary Magdalene's name before Jesus' relative. Simon, Peter, and John, the beloved, were foremost among the male disciples. Then I believe that Mary was foremost among the women followers. And probably she was our Lord's closest female friend. And the scriptures do not tell us when Jesus and Mary met. The Gospels of Mark and Luke state that Jesus had cured Mary of seven demons. Some had interpreted the reference to seven demons to mean that Mary Magdalene was a wicked woman or a prostitute before she met Jesus. A custom later arose of naming agencies or shelters that ministered to fallen women and wayward girls as Magdalene Paul. Some of you may have heard of that. The scriptures, however, do not give any basis for such an assessment of her character. In the Gospels, Mary Magdalene is always held in high regard. Yes. In the time that the New Testament was written, all sickness, whether physical or mental, was regarded as evil or the work of the devil. If someone was born with a birth defect, it was believed that he or she had reached evil because of somebody else's sin. If someone became ill, it was believed that he or she had been assaulted by evil or possessed by demons. Most current New Testament scholars believe that Mary's condition was probably mental, not moral. If this is true, then it follows that she probably suffered from periods of insanity. Whether Mary's condition came through heredity or some crisis in her life, we don't know. You know, the number seven in Scripture Scholars tell us represents wholeness or completeness. Thus, when the Bible says that Mary Magdalene was possessed by seven demons, it may mean that there were times when she was totally dominated yes. by the evil affliction that came upon her and caused her to suffer. Mary, then, would have been a tormented person with no hope of a normal before she met Jesus. Yes. Like the demon-possessed man known as Legion, Mary Magdalene was troubled by many things. Her behavior may not have been as wild and as erratic as Legion, but her mind was disoriented, her spirit was confused, and her appearance was disheveled. When one's mind and spirit are not at peace, one's appearance is also affected. At some point, the lives of Mary and Jesus from Magdalene, they, they crossed, and, and he did for her what he had done for so many others. He healed her. He touched her, and oh, what joy that flooded her. 
her soul. Yes. He brought peace to her mind and peace to her spirit and she became a new creation. Gone were, I'd imagine, the alternating wild and hollow looks. Gone, I'd imagine, were the sunken cheeks and the unkempt hair. Gone were the voices in her that drove her to do strange things. Gone were the bizarre thoughts that disrupted her life. Mary became a devoted and committed follower of Christ. I'm going somewhere. Mary is called Magdalene because she came from the village of Magdala, which was located on the coast of Galilee, about three miles from the Capernaum. Some believe that Mary had been connected with the primitive dye works or textile industry of that community at that time, which would have afforded her the financial resources to support the work of our Lord. And evidently, she was single, because she was free to follow the Lord wherever he went. Healed, Mary supported Jesus in his travels so that he might do for others what he had done for her. Healed, Mary devoted herself to the person who had given her her life back. Mary epitomizes the best of a grateful heart. You know, we often say that we are grateful to others for what they have done for us. But the question is, how do we show our gratitude? By our willingness to give back and invest in those who have done so much for us. A thankful heart and a grudging spirit are contradictions. Mouths that open with praise and hands that are closed to giving yes, yes. are inconsistent actions. Right. If one is truly thankful, then one cannot be cheap and stingy at the same time. Yes. Selfishness asks, what can I get? Ingratitude asks, what can I keep? But thanksgiving asks, what can I give? It was a thankful heart that prompted David even to ask, What shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Mary Magdalene had a thankful heart, and Mary's thankful heart was realistic. She understood that Jesus and the disciples needed money. Like everybody else. And they didn't have much of it. You know, one of the most amazing facts of history is this. That a poor man stands in its center. The individual whose life has done the most to redeem the history and transform the future of humanity was not the ruler of a great empire like Genghis Khan or Charlemagne, nor was he a great general like Alexander the Great or Napoleon, nor was he a financier like Andrew Carnegie or, or uh, John Rockefeller, neither was he a scientist like Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein. History stands or falls on the light of a poor man. The purest and most notable and noble life in the history of all humanity was that of a poor man. The name that devils fear and before which angels and humans fall to confess as Lord belonged to a poor man who was so poor that when he died all he owned was the robe on his back. Jesus was so poor that he had to depend upon the goodness of others even to eat. He could have, he could have uh, turned the stones in the road into bread and the water. He, he drank into wine, but, but he never used his gifts, his powers for himself. Yes. Only and always for others. Thus he had nothing, yet he had everything. Because he had people who loved him. He had people who loved him enough to provide whatever he needed. Nobody who has the loyalty, love, and respect of others will ever be poor. Nobody who has loving 
loving friends to help provide for them will ever be poor. Jesus and Mary Magdalene, they made a good team. She helped provide the physical and financial uh, support that he needed. He gave her the spiritual nourishment and sustenance that her life needed. So they each gave to each other. Don't miss this. Those are always the best relationships. Those that are generous enough to give to each other and mature enough to receive yes. from each other. Yes. In some relationships, one party always gives while the other one always receives. You got friends like that? Sometimes the one who is receiving believes he or she has nothing to give and thus offers nothing. Sometimes the giver is too proud to receive anything from the other. But Mary Magdalene and Jesus gave to each other. Now here's something else I discovered. Let's let us know that it took courage. It took a lot of courage for Mary to support Jesus. Can we imagine how it must have looked to sick and petty and trashy minds of that era for a single woman such as Mary Magdalene to follow a single man such as Jesus around the country? Can't we just imagine the cruel things that people may have said about Jesus and about Mary? Some undoubtedly said that Jesus was taking advantage of her. That he had cast some sort of spell over her perhaps. That he was taking her for a ride. And that he was after all that he could get from her. Some probably talked about how he was how she was running after Jesus in hopes of fulfilling some kind of fantasy. Imagine some of the good sisters, if you will, at Jacob's well, or the brothers gathered in the marketplace as they said, ain't it a shame how she's running after him? <laughs> Everywhere you see him, you see her. <laughs> Where there's smoke, there's got to be fire. Something's got to be going on. It took courage for Mary to linger in the 
in that cross. Mary's love in the hour of Jesus' death showed the same commitment as it had during his life. As her love had not feared the criticism and reproach of those who did not understand her actions as she supported Jesus' ministry, so her love did not fear the reproach of the Roman soldiers as she lingered near the cross. Mary was right or die. Mary was there when the body of Jesus was taken down from the cross, and she was there when it was laid in Joseph, Joseph's tomb. When the stone was rolled to the door, Mary Magdalene was still there. She didn't leave like some of us do at the graveside when they start throwing dirt, we gone. She lingered until the end. And as she started for her own home, I imagine that she would have thought to herself, whoever would have thought that it would have ended like this? Whoever would have thought that a life so noble, so full of love and goodness would have come to such a tragic end? Whoever would have thought that a life with so much to offer would end up on a cross at such an early age? However, Mary had this consolation. She had kept her body yes. and followed Jesus to the end. Not halfway, but to the end. No matter how badly things had turned out, she had done what she was supposed to do. And beloved, in our lives, sometimes things don't turn out as we would like them. But if our love has been faithful, we can receive consolation in knowing that we have done what we were supposed yes, to do. Yes. Sometimes our marriages don't work out. We can give our all, but it takes more than one. That's right. If our spouse doesn't do his or her part, and we know that we've done our best, we have the consolation of knowing that we have done what we are supposed to do. All we can do is what we're supposed to do. Sometimes our children don't turn out as we might desire. The streets can turn the heads of young people from their home train. But if as parents we have tried to raise them in the church and provide the best home we can and live the right kind of life before them, at some point they must make their own decision about whom they will serve and what kind of men and women they will be. Sometimes their choice hurts us. Yes. But if we've done what we're supposed to, all we can do is leave them in the hands of the Lord and linger on our knees and pray that they will come to themselves before it's too late. Sometimes situations don't turn out as we desire, in spite of our prayers. In spite of our prayers, loved ones don't get well. In spite of our prayers, folks still get sick and die. Yeah. In spite of our prayers, the programs we sponsor from a sincere heart fall below our expectations. Yeah. The projects with which we are involved this allow them to become, uh, become unsuccessful. But if we have given our all, we can still hold our heads up because we have done what we're supposed to do. Sometimes that not preach. I can't see that any heart and attitudes have been changed. I don't see folk running to join the church. I'm not sure that my message has really been heard or done any good, but at least I have this consolation yes, yes, yes. that I have fulfilled my life Amen. and I've done what I'm supposed to do. Yes. As Mary Magdalene left the tomb, Imagine she promised herself that she was going to return. And according to John's gospel on the first day of the week, Mary came to the tomb while it was still dark and saw a stone rolled away. And she ran to tell Peter and John, and then they ran back to the tomb and left. But, but Mary, right as I, kept on leaving. Because she kept lingering, she heard a voice that 
they didn't hear. Jesus called her by name because she kept on lingering. She saw what they didn't see. She saw Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord. Because she lingered, she has the distinction of being the first person to see Jesus in the glory of his resurrection. Yes, yes. Lingering love may seem sometimes, beloved, like wasted love and energy. But the lesson of Mary Magdalene's example for all of us today is that lingering love is reward. If we stay when others leave, if we keep on when others stop, if we draw near when others draw away, if we are faithful when others desert, if we live right when others compromise, if we stay on our knees when others give up, if we keep loving when others lose patience, if we believe when others doubt, if we give freely when others want to strip, if we give all when our others hold back, we shall see Jesus in his glory. I believe our lingering love will be rewarded. Across the ages, his promise comes to those who are possessed with a lingering love. His 